Peter Schnell war ein Loser. Every soldier in the brigade knew this, especially himself. It's not that he was a bad guy, it's just that he wasn't really good at anything. He passed the army physical fitness test, but no matter how hard he tried, he always did everything with difficulty, tight, red-faced and chugging like a steam engine, barely able to keep up the time. Usually after a run, he had to step aside and vomit. Sometimes he didn't get far, so most guys knew to give him some time. He couldn't seem to get into really good shape, no matter how hard he tried. He always reminded me of a sack of potatoes. The qualifying rounds meant he would be the last one to leave the range, again, just barely making the cut. He had a bad haircut, a crumpled uniform, shoelaces that were always untied, and a crumpled hat that was lopsided. That's the kind of soldier he was. It was so deep in him that it made him secretly wonder if he was a soldier who crumpled himself instead of his uniform. Through persistence and a lot of luck, he was promoted to sergeant. It was just that many more sergeants were needed that year than usual. This happens sometimes, especially in wartime. No one really disliked him, but no one really considered him their best friend. He didn't communicate with the other guys, didn't play video games or watch many movies because he had a tendency to get nasty headaches. He was not a leader. No one will follow him to hell. Maybe to the cafeteria, at least on pizza day, but not to hell. The only noticeable thing he ever did was climb into a burning Humvee to pull out another soldier after blowing him up with an improvised explosive device. A couple of minutes later, a badly burned soldier, Private Tony Campbell, died in his arms before the evacuation helicopter approached. The guy was also just joining the guard. It devastated him and pretty much destroyed all of Schnell's self-esteem. Schnell ended up getting a medal for what he did, but it was more like the command saying, you really tried hard. At the awards ceremony, when they were describing his attempt to console a dying soldier, I remember that he looked very green the entire time. It was clear that he felt that he had failed again. His marriage, if you can call it that, was an absolute disaster. He married more or less because his overbearing mother wanted him to. She introduced him to a girl named Janice, whom she liked very much, perhaps even more than she ever liked him. It was as if his opinion was imposed on him. The marriage lasted less than three years, and ended worse than usual while we were on a business trip. We weren't on the way out very long before rumors began to spread. Janice was seen at the club. Janice was seen with a guy in a restaurant. Janice was seen with a guy at a hotel. Janice actually put some guy in their house. Four different guys. A couple of civilians and a couple of military. It's pretty daring to put some guy in their house on base, and the brigade sergeant major heard about it and put a stop to it. There were rumors that he also ruined a couple of careers because of it, but I never knew for sure. It couldn't really affect her civilian boyfriends, but no soldier was ever beyond the reach of a truly pissed-off Sergeant Major. I think someone must have told Schnell everything, too. Janice found out he knew and emptied the house and their bank account of all his combat pay and savings. By the day he arrived, she was long gone, so he returned to an empty house. This may have been the worst part of it all. He never managed to demand an explanation from her. He never got to meet her face to face, tell her who she was, and get her to accept this crap, at least for a moment. And maybe regain a little self-respect. Or, in Schnell's case, maybe grow a little self-respect. He couldn't even turn to his family, as his mother apparently believed all the stories Janice told her and pretty much disowned him. Or maybe Janice told her the truth since neither of them seemed to be thinking about him to begin with. All he could do was move on and sign the divorce papers that had been left on the kitchen table. There was simply no point in contesting anything. Six weeks later, the divorce was finalized. He had to pay Janice some maintenance for six months. She claimed to be broke, and even said that she sold his car. There were rumors that one of her boyfriends was driving around in his old car, so she probably just gave it to the guy. In keeping with time-honored military tradition, a couple of guys collected some money and took him to a really high-end strip club in Atlanta. It was probably more out of a sense of duty than because they actually liked him. Instead of getting tons of lap dances and getting drunk like he should have done, I heard him whining to one of the girls there all the time about how his life was crap. 
I was almost sure that he himself paid for the time while she listened to him. Sergeant Schnell simply was not a winner. He never was, and now he won't have that opportunity. He lies in a coffin. I attended his funeral for no real specific reason. He was not one of my soldiers. He was not in my company, let alone the platoon for which I was responsible. I didn't know him that well. I didn't even know he was still in the squad. I vaguely remembered that sometime after our return, he was appointed to brigade headquarters, but that was all. In fact, I haven't seen him for months. By the time of the funeral, there weren't even that many of us left in the unit who were sent here with him. This is a soldier's life. Transfers to another unit every few years. Perhaps because of this, he made it clear to his command that he did not want his funeral to be mandatory and did not want a full military funeral. Why drag people to the funeral of someone they didn't even know? He wanted everything to be quiet. For some reason, this bothered me. I even heard that he was supposed to be cremated immediately after the funeral. Soldiers are soldiers, even Peter Schnell, and the thought of not having a full funeral hurt me a little. My wife was back home helping her mother renovate the house, so I had too much free time. Schnell just kept bubbling to the surface of my brain. This thought tormented me until I got up that Saturday morning, put on my dress suit, and headed to church on the hill. When I arrived, the church was almost empty. There was only the brigade sergeant major standing by the coffin and the colonel looking out at the almost empty parking lot. The chaplain must have gone out for a moment. I walked over to pay my respects and looked down at Schnell. He was wrinkled, as if folded in on himself, and instead of the usual bad haircut, his head was shaved bald. He was waxed pale. Cancer. I turned towards the voice. Sergeant Major? Brain cancer, Sergeant. Those headaches he always had? It turned out to be inoperable brain cancer, he said in a wooden voice, staring at the body. I closed my eyes for a second. Out of all the crap we've been through, he's dying of cancer? Not the fastest death. Something, almost a smile, touched the corner of the sergeant major's mouth. That's right, sergeant. That's exactly how it was. I blinked. He seemed almost pleased. But the sergeant major is never satisfied, at least according to my experience. And it sure as hell wouldn't be at a soldier's funeral. He looked me up and down. Your uniform looks good. I'll need help folding the flag. I nodded. At least I could do something. It wasn't really a request anyway. We talked and I stood at the back of the church so that at the right time I could come forward and help with the flag. At first I thought that it would only be me, the brigade commander and the sergeant major, but little by little soldiers began to arrive. Some are in full dress, some are in casual uniforms, and some are in civilian clothes. Actually much more than I expected. I guess it wasn't just me that was eating up, but it was still only a small amount for a huge church. I was watching the clock move slowly when I heard a murmur run through the crowd. Schnell's ex-wife came inside, along with an elderly woman who must have been his mother. Janice defiantly walked straight to the front of the church and, without even looking at the casket or attempting to pay her respects, walked straight to the empty, immediate family pew at the front. Just as they were about to sit down, the sergeant major came up and blocked their way. He gently but firmly directed them one bench back. I saw Schnell's ex-wife hiss at him, trying to argue, but it was pretty pointless. A man wouldn't achieve his position by giving in to anyone. They looked more than a little annoyed, but backed off. After about three minutes, the world completely froze, losing all meaning. A long black limousine pulled up almost silently to the main steps of the church. They left, walked straight up the stairs to the main doors of the church, then straight down the center aisle of the church. Perfectly in step, perfectly in sync. It was unreal, more like a scene from a movie than anything from real life. As they passed by, I felt something click in my brain, like a flash of radio interference on the network. A perfect mix of the most attractive women I have ever seen. Not just the cute girls next door, or even cute enough that she should be in a movie. They looked eerily flawless and untouchable. Perfect, polished, and graceful. A strangely chosen set, although they were completely different. Red-haired with bright green eyes, partially hidden by a black veil that covers half of her face. 
icy platinum blonde with pale blue eyes and pale white skin. A tiny rakish veil barely covered her forehead. An Asian girl, probably Korean, judging by her appearance, with the same slanted short veil, and a dark-skinned girl with light brown eyes above high cheekbones, who had the same slanted short veil. They were wearing the same dress, tight-fitting, black silk, insanely short, with the back cut as low as legally possible, black silk gloves, and 15-centimeter stiletto heels that no woman I've ever met would even try to wear. However, they walked straight down the aisle, in perfect syncopation. They moved with absolute grace and elegance. I admit I got distracted for a moment. A stupid thought flashed through my head. You don't see this every day? Before it was supplanted by an appreciation for the incredible view, they walked straight towards the coffin, lined up perfectly along it, heads bowed, slowly reaching towards each other until they were holding hands. After a very long moment, they silently broke away from Sergeant Schnell and walked towards the front bench. The Sergeant Major stepped towards them and I held my breath. He took funerals very seriously, and although the dresses, at least what could be considered dresses, were black, they looked more like something that belonged on a catwalk or as an escort than in a church. He stopped at the end of the bench in front of the redhead and, to my complete and utter shock, greeted her respectfully and, with a very formal gesture, invited her to take his place on the front bench. Each of the women stopped in front of him just long enough so that he could address her with words that I could hear through the suddenly silent church. I'm sorry for your loss. Military funerals are already solemn and quiet, but Peter Schnell's funeral was held in almost deathly silence. Everyone in the church seemed to hold their breath, afraid that any sound could break the spell that had been cast. The chaplain spoke. The brigade commander gave a brief eulogy that completely lacked a single word about his family, and focused on Schnell's hope that everyone would make the most of every bit of their lives. I waited for something, anything, to explain to the four women with their heads bowed and holding hands in the front pew, but nothing came. All too soon, the shot was playing over the speakers, and then I was helping fold the flag, stepping back to watch the sergeant major hand it to the brigade commander. Schnell's mother half stood up, but slowly sat back down in shock, watching as he walked up to the redhead and handed the flag to her. The four women did not move at all. They sat as quiet and motionless as possible throughout the ceremony. But I could see the tears flowing unabashedly and steadily down their faces. At the end of the funeral, the four women stood as one and walked out. The blonde in front, while the redhead was led behind her with her head down, clutching a flag, flanked by two other women. There was one tiny moment when they passed his ex-wife, and I thought, I saw something. For just a second I was sure I had seen something when the redhead's eyes darted to her ex-wife. It was hatred unbridled, poisonous, and absolute hatred. Then it all disappeared as she focused ahead and they walked out the church doors to the waiting limousine. I saw his mother and ex-wife staring after them with their mouths agape. On my way out, I stopped to watch as Janice ran into the sergeant major in the parking lot. Who was that? He raised one eyebrow languidly. It's actually none of your business. Blushing, she stared at him. Shouldn't the flag have been given to his mother? Not in this case. The flag goes to his family. But she's his family, not according to him. What about his benefits? It dawned on me that this was exactly what she was really looking for. Soldiers have pretty substantial life insurance coverage, for obvious reasons, and most of it pays out at law, meaning it will go to a spouse or children. If a soldier has neither, it usually goes to his mother. The sergeant major sighed wearily and looked at his watch. Thirty-three minutes. I was wondering how long it would take you to give away the real reason you were here. She stared at him, trying to say something, but he cut her off. You don't have to worry about that, either. It's not your problem, and not his mother. He raised his voice so he couldn't be heard in the rest of the parking lot. Have a good day, damn you, woman of easy virtue. He slid into his car and started it, 
driving away without even glancing in her direction. And that seemed to be all. Of course, that was not all. I heard that Janice showed up multiple times with a lawyer in tow, and after several meetings and a lot of screaming and yelling, she finally left defeated. However, other than that, I didn't hear anything. Brigade headquarters was always the center of rumors, but if anyone knew anything, they kept it to themselves. I lost track of everything when I was promoted to staff sergeant and then transferred to another base, although from time to time memories of the funeral would pop into my mind, leaving me lost and confused. More than a year passed before I received an invitation to the sergeant major's retirement ceremony. The base he was at was only a day's drive away, so I decided to go there. Once the official ceremony was over, everyone headed to the reception, which was actually a big barbecue picnic. I wandered around for a bit until he called me over. Have a seat first, Sergeant. Sergeant Major, thought you heard about it. I myself recommended you for this position. You deserve it. Thank you. I sat down with my beer, and we talked about how my company was raising new soldiers. After that, although we fell silent, I looked at him, and for a moment, I saw him watching me. He raised his beer. Well, let's ask. I started to deny it, but decided that there was no point in it. So what the hell does this all mean? A gloomy grimace slowly appeared on his face. Schnell was finished, and he knew it. Shortly after you guys returned from the mission, he went to the doctor because of headaches, but this one examined him well and found a tumor. There was nothing anyone could do except help with painkillers. He was given the strongest of them for just over a year and a half. We transferred him to brigade headquarters so he could concentrate on just keeping himself together and getting things in order. We decided that when it got really bad, we could transfer him to the hospital. This sucks, I shook my head. He was just always damn lucky. He nodded slowly. Psychologists tried to talk to him, but you know how it happens. I sighed. They did it for the sake of formality. Yes. And finally, one of the psychologists said that he needed to talk to someone, anyone. He couldn't think of anyone he thought actually cared about him. Certainly not his ex or his mother, damn it. A slight smile appeared on his face. Then he remembered someone who actually listened to him. Do you remember when Michaels and Diaz took him to Atlanta? Yes, but it didn't look like he was having fun there. No, maybe not as everyone expected, but one of the girls sat down and let him tell her all about how his wife cheated on him and left him. Tell him all about how his life turned into crap. I looked at him when I got suspicious. Indeed? Indeed, a redhead named Amber. So he returned to the club, found her, and sat with her again. It all just poured out of him, all of it. Cancer, loneliness, everything. He told her he wished he had the courage to just end it, just end it all. He leaned back, taking a sip of beer. I don't know which of them came up with this idea. It doesn't really matter, but they made a deal. He marries her, makes her the beneficiary of his military and civilian insurance policies, and she makes whatever is left for him a decent life. This made me chuckle. It looks like she could do it, and she damn sure did it. In total, he had just over a million in insurance payouts. You can do a lot with a million dollars on the line. She invited three of her friends to join her, the other three girls who were at the funeral, Tasha, Lynn, and Sienna. Professional women? Yes, dancers and high-class escorts, just like Amber. He pulled out his phone and placed it on the table. But they actually did it. He was never, ever alone. He had one or more of them with him all the time usually three. Amber asked Sienna, the blonde, to create a schedule to be absolutely sure. The sergeant major shook his head. If it weren't for all this crap, she'd be a damn good HQ operations officer. He pressed the screen of his phone for a second and moved it so I could see as he scrolled through the photos. Wedding photograph of Peter Schnell in a tuxedo with his new wife wearing a wedding dress that must have been purchased at Frederick's of Hollywood. Apparently, that's where these three bridesmaid dresses came from. The smiles looked quite real. I was sure that it was so. 
There were photos of him and his new wife in Cancun on their honeymoon. Only they were not alone. There were three bridesmaids with them. The women were dressed in swimsuits that seemed to be made from wishful thinking and some kind of string, but there wasn't much of either. They spent this last year doing everything they could think of. He flipped through the photographs. They were at restaurants, at baseball games, at the beach, hiking and camping. In most of the photographs, the women were dressed just enough to avoid being arrested. In the camping photos, they were barely long enough flannel shirts and boots, and I hoped they had enough repellent stocked up. Looks like he spent his money well. Looks like it. I think Tasha, Lynn, and Sienna got more than they bargained for. I don't know how they felt about it at the beginning, but by the end, when he was already in the hospital, they were all there. They held his hands, read to him, sang and talked to him until the very end. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, one of them was always there. When he left, they were all there, all the time. Damn sure it wasn't about the money by then. He would never have known if it was gone. He studied the table for a minute. I was there. They really loved him. I took a closer look at the photos and managed to ignore the remarkable amount of exposed skin. So Lynn touched his hand and leaned her head against him, sitting by the fire. Tasha pressed her forehead against his as they played catch, both of them clearly laughing almost to the point of tears. Sienna held him as they floated in the water, both half asleep and dreamy. And Amber was always there, watching him with concern and care, weaving her laughter into his. She held his hand every chance she got. There was not the slightest hint of jealousy anywhere. Schnell sent me two albums with photographs. There are probably 200 photographs, maybe more. One of the albums is at my headquarters. I don't know what the hell to do with him. What happened to the other one? He told me to do whatever I want with him. I gave it to his ex-wife. After I gave it to her, she finally stopped arguing about the insurance. Many of the photos are more candid than the ones on my phone. They make it pretty clear that they did everything they could to make him forget about her existence. Not the fastest death. Yes, it is, isn't it? He looked at the night sky. Although I don't think it was ever about the money. Not for Amber, anyway. Indeed? When Schnell told me about the deal, I got worried. I thought there was a vulture lurking and I wasn't going to let that happen, so I did a little research on things. Found something a little strange and just decided to let things run their course. I was right. I found this out just a few weeks ago. She must have had about three months at the funeral. He brought up a photo on his phone. It showed Amber, much less formal in jeans and a t-shirt, smiling and holding a baby, along with a photo of Schnell in full-dress uniform. The child's resemblance to Schnell was unmistakable. I blinked. What the heck? Schnell never really figured it all out and connected the dots. He was too distracted to really pay attention to anything other than the fact that, at first, she truly seemed to be the only one who cared. Then, he was distracted. I think I can understand that. Diaz admitted that Amber paid him to have Schnell at her club in Atlanta that very first time. I never said anything. And I'm pretty sure Schnell never understood anything. She didn't want him to know. Knew that? He pointed to the shelf behind her in the photograph where there was another photograph in a black frame of another soldier. She had a twin brother. Her last name was Campbell. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.